Okay, wow, this is being immortalized. All right. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Tom Graham. Um, I joined Bob's lab uh, recently within the last, uh, I guess it's been what, six or seven months now? Um, and I came from industry where I worked at Merck. Uh, I spent the past, uh, I guess it was four or five years there within the translational medicine group. Um, and a part of my role there was to uh, develop uh, pet imaging agents for a number of different therapeutic areas. One of one one of them being uh, neuroscience. Um, you know, in addition, uh, we also worked on oncology-related imaging agents. So, toward the end of my time there, in addition to doing uh, preclinical pet probe development, I was also involved in a clinical pet probe uh, that we were trying to develop in the context of uh, one of the oncology assets at Merck, uh, Keytruder. Pembrolizumab, and so, um, you know, my my sort of background prior to that really is uh, that of a synthetic chemist. So my PhD is in synthetic organic chemistry. Um, I did a little bit of radiochemistry uh, toward the end of that. Um, part of my time was spent at Merck doing that, and the other part of my time was spent here at Penn, actually in uh, Hank Kung's lab. Um, and I did a postdoc with Bob, um, but I think it was only what six or seven months that I ended up sticking around for. Um, and I was, you know, I was promptly warned by Bob when I left that I would uh, eventually find find that I'd become bored with the industry lifestyle and it ended up being true. And so, so here I am back at, uh, back at Penn. And so today so what I want to, <laughs> what's that? We welcome you. We're the winners of that decision. That's Thank great. you. Well, so what, I, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is something that I spent a lot of time doing at Merck, right? And that's essentially developing receptor occupancy plasma drug level relationships between um, uh, drug candidates. So in this particular context, I'm going to talk about um, 5-HT2A uh, receptor and a 5-HT2A uh, agonist um, known as psilocybin or, or psilocin. The reason why I picked this particular target, right, is because um, I think it's attracting a lot of attention recently. Um, there have been a number of studies that have been published by uh, groups at Hopkins and NYU and, and elsewhere sort of indicating that um, these drugs, namely 5-HT2A agonists, are having uh, fairly profound effects in a number of uh, potential areas, right, depression, anxiety, and so on. Um, and you know, what, what I'm not going to talk about today are, you know, what I would describe as the complex history of these substances, you know, within the context of the U.S. and elsewhere, right? Um, you know, they were discovered in the in the 50s and, and earlier, right? In Western culture, they were rediscovered, right? And in other cultures, they've been around for quite some time. Um, you know, they are, are really sort of something that is very loaded topic, right? There's a very loaded sort of conversation that often happens in terms of, you know, whether, whether or not we agree or disagree that they have a therapeutic benefit, what the consequences of society are, and so on. So I'm going to steer clear of that. I'm also going to steer clear of discussing the subjective scales that different practitioners use to assess uh, the impact of these drugs, right? They're, they're usually questionnaires. Um, there's a variety of them out there. Um, suffice to say, I think we can all agree that they're a decent way of measuring some of the subjective effects of these drugs. Um, so in particular, the agenda is basically to, to start off with a brief history of psilocybin. Um, some of it's really basic pharmacology. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, CNS exposure of drugs, right? Why would we even bother doing receptor occupancy studies? Um, and then from there, we'll talk about an example at Merck that um, I think is a really nice sort of use of a, of a receptor occupancy tool to answer a, a really fundamentally important biological question. Um, in this case, it's CGPR, uh, which is a, a target actually that's become relevant again recently because Amgen has an antibody now approved to uh, target migraines with, um, against this target. Um, and then we'll sort of go into SIMBI, right, which is the tracer we're talking about. Um, some of the PK uh, RO uh, data that they generated, if there are any weaknesses, we can chat about that as well. And then toward the end, I'll leave with a, a P30 relevant piece of information 
Um, I, I think it's a, an observation that has been, you know, may or may not be reproducible. Who knows, right? It was, it was done in the uh, mid 80s. Um, however, it, it seems intriguing, per, perhaps worth follow up and maybe uh, there's some data from this from this study that may or may not support some of the conclusions that they have. So please interrupt me like whenever, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or go into further detail like as you guys feel necessary. Sounds like a good banquet. Plunge in. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to start with this quote, right? And it's, you know, it's a little funny, right? Yogi Bear is not exactly known as, you know, the brightest bulb in the bunch, but, you know, it's really, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And I, and I think as a biomarker guy, you know, this really resonates with me, um, especially in CNS drug discovery, right? Like there are so many possible ways that things cannot work out, right? I mean, you can have the best the best compound, right? Something that gets into the brain, there's no, there's no liabilities associated with it, it seems safe, um, right? And then sort of the best laid plans don't end up sort of working out how we want them to do, uh, right? And I think what's an unforgivable sin in drug, drug discovery, drug development, is failing for the wrong reasons, meaning you didn't set up your trial correctly, you didn't have appropriate biomarkers, uh, you didn't validate those biomarkers, and so on. Um, and, I, and I think there's a great danger in this particular field for, for things like that to occur, especially uh, with, with a drug that causes so many subjective effects. Which is why I think development of a of, of biomarker strategy is really important moving forward to make sure that you know this area develops the way it should or should not based on efficacy. Um, there we go. All right, so I'm just gonna chat a little bit about some of the some of the history of psilocybin in, in Western culture. Right? So in, in the late 50s, uh, our Gordon Wasson, Wasson and, and Roger Heim uh, went down to Mexico where they met Maria Sabina, um, who uh, gave them fruiting, or uh, she gave uh, them fruiting bodies from the psilocybin Mexicana mushroom, um, and they consumed them. And they, they took part in sort of, you know, not, not really you know, a religious ceremony. It was more, uh, you know, a couple of white, white guys ingesting mushrooms and sitting in the basement and seeing what happens. Um, you know, th that being said, it had a profound impact on them. Our Gordon Wasson went back and wrote a, um, a short article that ended up in Life magazine uh, the year after. And then, you know, thus the, the Western world was introduced to um, psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, and then shortly thereafter, Roger Heim collected these um, uh, mushrooms and mycelium spores, right? And he was able to grow them, on him uh, uh, grow these compounds himself. And he submitted and sent some of them to Albert Hoffman at, at Sandoz, right, which is now Roche. And Albert Hoffman underwent a process by which he isolated um, the active ingredients or the active compounds within these mushrooms. Um, and so, pictured on the right here are those two compounds that he isolated. The, the first one here is psilocybin, and the second one is psilocin. Right, and psilocybin, as we'll sort of discuss later, is a prodrug of, of psilocin. Right, and, you know, as was common back in the day, you have nice pictures of the shiny crystals and so on, and he had to use IR and melting points and, and, and so on to figure it out. So shortly thereafter, um, Sandoz, right, which is a pharmaceutical company, um, introduces indocybin, right, which is the commercialized form of psilocybin, um, which is the synthetic um, compound that Albert Hoffman worked out a synthesis for to psychiatry. Um, it didn't take long for endocybin to be discontinued by Sandoz, um, you know, and it was later designated within a short period of time within the U.S. as a controlled substance and sort of, not sort of, but in, in the rest of the world again as a controlled substance. Um, so the two pictures below I have are, you know, a bottle of these tablets and then I think on the right is an institute that is really difficult to ignore when um, studying the history of the use of uh, psychedelic agents uh, within the U.S., right? and that's Spring Grove Hospital Center. Um, and there's a nice paper that uh, is unpublished. It's, it's based on a, a talk that was given, and it sort of reviews the 30 years of psychedelic research at Spring Grove. Um, and once the uh, Control Substances Act passed in 1971, the last doses of of psychedelics administered in the U.S. were at Spring Grove in, in the late 70s. And so 
um, at, at this time, right, there was a big gap. So between 1980 and uh, the early 2000s, there were no uh, sanctioned um, studies with psychedelic agents within the U.S. So let's just take a little bit of a step back, right, and then think think a bit about you know where psilocybin or psilocin comes from, right? And so there are a number of uh, mushrooms uh, that produce psilocybin. Uh, so picture on the right here is psilocybin cubensis, which is a fairly common uh, mushroom. This this mushroom exists within the United States, right? And here it's kind of growing on its uh, natural. Uh, growing in its natural habitat, right, which is a, a moist sort of wet climate on, on cow dung. And so psilocybin is a secondary metabolite of tryptophan. So there are a number of enzymes within um, these mushrooms that convert tryptophan to tryptamine and then tryptamine into further secondary metabolites. Um, and the primary constituents of these mushrooms are either baocystin, which is 10, uh, which is the desmethyl version of Psilocin, which you see pictured on the right, and then psilocybin, uh, which is pictured in the middle here. And so the concentration of these compounds vary depending on, on the species. They can either be very minute or very, very high, depending on, on, on which uh, mushroom we, we refer to. So in terms of their activity or their bioactivity, psilocybin itself, right, as I mentioned earlier, is not an active agent. It's a prodrug. So when it's ingested orally, um, it's rapidly metabolized into psilocin, uh, which then undergoes um, second phase metabolism either through uh, uh, I can never pronounce this thing the right way, gluconuridation, um, or the fairly typical oxidation type pathways that then lead to metabolites so that are further excreted. Hey, Tom. Yes. This is Jake. Is this all hepatic? I think so, yes. There's, there's, an, there's an enzyme that's responsible for this cleavage. Do we know which pathway, which CYP450 pathway? Uh, I, I'm sure, I think these are all fairly well established and I, I think in the literature it's out there. You know, one could easily follow up. All right, I'll take a peek. Thanks. Yeah, okay. yep. Um, and I, you know, what I want to sort of point out here, right, is, is when we do these RO studies, uh, one needs to be cognizant or aware that you're not measuring psilocybin concentration in vivo, right? That's, that's irrelevant. What we're really interested in is psilocin concentration in, in plasma. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of giving myself the unfortunate task of trying to describe the subjective effects of these substances. Um, I'll try to do that as best as I can, but I kind of punt here. On the next slide, I'll just give you a carbon copy of what someone else said about it. Um, Right, and, and in, in general, when these drugs are, in this particular one, psilocybin is ingested orally, within 20 to 60 minutes, there's some uh, onset of activity, meaning uh, the subjective effects are first noticed. Uh, within about 30 minutes of that, um, the peak effects, peak subjective effects are felt, and then between two and four hours after the initiation of that, the effects wear off. Um, thereafter, people return to baseline. So in general, um, the acute effects of psilocin last from three to seven hours. Um, some of the longer effects of psilocin, what, what is sort of termed the after effects, and in some people's vernacular, that the afterglow is um, one to 24 hours uh, after that. So in, in terms of the basic pharmacology of psilocybin, it, you know, in psilocin, it's a little, little bit complicated, right? So psilocin displays polypharmacology, and what I mean by that is, is that uh, it has activity at a number of different receptors. Um, in particular, it has uh, a wide range of affinities for serotonin receptors, right? This is not surprising given the structural similarity between ser serotonin and psilocin. Um, it, it is fairly well established at this point that the psychedelic effects of psilocin occur because of engagement of 5-HD2A. So here I have two numbers. Uh, one is a KI against an agonist radioligand at 5-HT2A, and the other is at, at an antagonist. And this number really is, you know, fluctuates quite a bit depending on the study. So you'll see numbers as low as 5, five nanomolar all the way up to 100 nanomolar in this case, you know. So I, I kind of would take this with a grain of salt. But that being said, though, 
there are a number of other activities at serotonin receptors, uh, some of the adrenic receptors, and also at, at the D3 receptor. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, one second. So the, the studies, I think, that have really confirmed, at least in a clinical sense, that the psychedelic act activity of psilocin is a function of its 5-HD2A activity, right, is um, sort of two, there are two studies, right, there are two carefully done studies, um, and, and I sort of would direct you to this review by Nichols, which is, you know, close to 100 pages long. Um, it is kind of, you know, for, for lack of a better word, the Bible when it comes to uh, looking at what has been done with these, with these compounds. Um, but two of these studies were done in the, the early part of uh, 20, it was 2012 for psilocybin in particular, um, and they used the agent ketanserin, uh, uh, which is a 5-HT2A antagonist with a reasonable selectivity over 5-HT2C, uh, which is the other receptor that psilocin is known to bind to. Um, and when these agents, or ketanserin in particular, is dosed uh, prior to dosing psilocin, the subjective um, psychedelic effects of, of psilocin are completely eliminated. So those effects are a variety of variety of different things that I've sort of described here. Um, I think most commonly, what you know, you know, one has probably heard of, right, are sort of the visual distortions created by these drugs, um, uh, euphoria. Um, you know, a number of other you know, effects, auditory effects, uh, synesthesias, um, and then a number of transpersonal effects, right? Uh, this sort of sense of interconnectedness that a lot of people describe on higher doses of psilocin. So that's sort of where I'll, I'll kind of leave a description of the, of the psychedelic effects of these drugs. Um, and, you know, as we get later in the talk, they'll sort of describe some of these um, so-called subjective questionnaires or scales to get a sense of, of how strong the effects are, right? And they're, they're loosely based on people's self-reporting of, of how strong these particular effects are. <clears throat> so, you know, what I think one of the questions I wanted to sort of revisit, right, is what, why did I pick this particular topic? Now, there have been a number of studies over the last 10 years, which I think have begun to attract uh, the attention of, you know, obviously the public uh, and, and news groups and so on, like, you know, the mass media has picked up on a lot of this stuff. Um, but but not just not just those organizations, right? I think the regulatory uh, bodies, you know, namely FDA, has become interested in, in some of these findings as well, uh, in particular because the, the effect um, at least in some of the uh, double-blind randomized placebo controls done, uh, controlled trials done at NYU and Hopkins are, are quite remarkable. Now, I think the first sort of re-entry into the clinic uh, prior to, or sorry, uh, following the Control Substances Act in 1971 was done by uh, Dr. Rick Strassman at uh, University of New Mexico. Um, and he was able to get an FDA approved or sanctioned trial where they, used uh, IV dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is a 5-HD2A agonist as well, um, uh, uh, used in 60 healthy controls. So in this case, right, there's no blinding or controls, or there's no sort of therapeutic, um, you know, therapeutic interest here. And what he sort of showed in particular, right, was is that the drug was safe, um, even at very high doses, and there were sort of no lasting adverse events associated with them. Um, and then following up <clears throat> from a, a paper that was published in 2005 by Roland Griffiths, which I think it attracted a, a lot of attention. Um, I don't really discuss it in this particular talk, but you know I, I think it's out there. You can go have a look at it. Um, the, the title of it is enough to often, you know, turn some people's, you know, turn some people off, right? In, in essence, it's suggesting that. Uh, these drugs induce mystical experiences in, in the, the, the takers of them. Now, I think what I really want to focus on, right, is the, the therapeutic 
potential therapeutic benefit of these medications, right? And so I think following up on some of that, um, some folks at the University of Arizona adopted some of the trial design um, that Roland Griffiths uh, used, which was, you know, admittedly adopted from Spring Grove, right? Because some of the some of the uh, therapists at Spring Grove began working with with Roland Griffiths group uh, in order to help design some of those those early trials. Um, so the first trial was in OCD. Um, there was no, uh, you know, randomization or, or blinding, right? This there's no real placebo. So <clears throat> I, I think, you know, I won't really get into the effect size, right? I mean, the end number here between you know, five and, and and ten or five and twenty is is really small. You know, I don't think they're really significant. But um, if you're interested, I can certainly point you in the direction of these papers. They're, they're quite easy to find. Um, but what you sort of see is like what what I would describe as somewhat of a snowballing effect. You, you start to see these results reproduced. Um, in this case, existential distress in 2011, right? It's associated with anxiety created by uh, uh, end of life, right, in, in cancer patients. Um, a smoking cessation trial um, done at Hopkins. Um, a, a small trial done at the University of New Mexico with, with Rick Straussman, uh, an alcohol use disorder. Um, and then a trial that attracted a lot of attention at the Imperial College in London, which was um, using psilocybin and treatment resistant depression. Um, and then sort of two more recent um, well-designed um, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials at, at NYU and Hopkins. And I think these are really the two trials that, that stand out amongst the rest. Um, and the thing I really want to point out here, right, is the dosing between all these different trials is hard to wrap your head around at times. Um, <clears throat> some people dose <clears throat> on an MPK basis, others dose on a fixed dose. Um, and I, I think one of the challenges associated with translating some of these early clinical results is understanding, you know, very specifically what, what dose is responsible for achieving um, a therapeutic effect in these particular indications. And so what I'll sort of do next is, is talk about what, why I think that's really important. So I, I think that it, you know, this is, uh, not necessarily too controversial of a topic, right? But one of the most important pharmacokinetic parameters associated with all centrally act acting therapeutics and drugs, right, is the unbound brain concentration of a drug, right? And it's really this feature that governs target engagement and occupancy of a target, right? And then furthermore, that is directly related to pharmacodynamic effects of drugs, right? And so in, a, in, in context here, what I show is just a generic G protein couple receptor, right? I don't have the, the G proteins attached. Um, and in this case, I show a drug molecule binding, right? Creating activation, which can lead to signaling, which can then lead to some type of biological activity. Now, this concentration of drug, right, in a, in a clinical sense is very difficult to determine. Uh, in fact, it's not, it's not possible to directly determine a human being, right? Because uh, one would have to do a terminal study. So we can only indirectly measure this, either by um, measuring some type of change in the brain as a function of um, a pharmacodynamic effect, you know, i.e. fMRI, PET, um, or using some kind of subjective scale to assess pharmacodynamic effect, right? Now, subjective scales are, re are fine. They're used all the time as endpoints in, in, in clinical trials. However, uh, it's very difficult to translate preclinical findings to the clinic with a, a subjective scale, right? Because preclinical animals do not have uh, the capacity to communicate. Um, so, realistically speaking, one is sort of, in my opinion, right? And this is sort of the bias, part of the bias that you know I was taught at Merck is, is that you need to have an imaging-based biomarker to confirm uh, pharmacodynamic effects. Um, moving forward in order to reduce translational risk, right? And <clears throat> so what I want to, oh, there we go, delve into next is a relatively complex topic, <clears throat> but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Um, and I think the question at hand is, why, why is it so hard to measure the brain concentration of drug? Like, well, why is that so challenging, right? 
<clears throat> and if you have a, a sort of a very well-behaved idealized case, right, when you peripherally administer a drug, either PO, IV, IM, intranasal, um, a small molecule, right, distributes throughout the body. So this is sort of basic pharmacology. Um, the unbound brain to plasma ratio, which I'll refer to as KPUU, right, which is a, a more modern term that a lot of pharmaceutical groups now use to assess the penetration of a, of a molecule from the periphery into the central compartment, um, will approach unity um, with adjacent compartments, i.e. blood or CSF, assuming it lacks active transport via efflux, right? So PGP and BCRP, amongst others, are known efflux pumps. Um, or activity at influx, right? And the influx pumps, uh, um, th these are rare. This is not a common occurrence. Um, and then two, it's freely mem membrane permeable. And so what I mean by that, <clears throat> basically that the apparent permeability of the compound, the rate at which it moves across a cell membrane is sufficiently fast such that um, the, the penetration of the drug throughout all the compartments will reach steady state. Now, if this is the case, the KPUU, uh, will will reach one, right? So the concentration of free drug in all three of these compartments will be unity. However, if there is active efflux, um, the KPUUs will be significantly lower than one. Um, and, you know, speaking from my experience, I've seen programs where this number can be as low as 0.01 to 0.08, um, you know, and there's some correlation with in vitro parameters measuring the, the relative rates at which compounds are efflux, but in general, it, it's a tough it's a tough bet. Now, if you get KPU is greater than one, um, that usually implies some amount of active transport. Again, this is rare, um, and if that's not the case, then you've done your experiment wrong, right? And these numbers right here are all determined terminally, right? So non-human primates or rodents are sacrificed. You take homogenates. Um, of either the brain, or you take CSF, or you take blood, blood, and then you determine plasma levels, CSF levels, and brain levels. Um, and then you use equilibrium dialysis methods to, to calculate free fraction. This is very, very costly uh, to, to do. Now, <clears throat> let's just sort of take a really simple example here. So let's think about example drug one, which is sort of loosely based on a drug that I'm familiar with. Uh, that I worked on at, at Merck. And in this case, you have no PGP BCRP liability. You know there's no active e influx. Um, the C max after dosing is around 500 nanomolar in plasma. Again, right, this is the total concentration of drug in plasma. C max is about an hour. Uh, the free fraction in plasma is around 50%, and the free fraction in brains around 25%. And so the KDE I've sort of pushed up, which is the affinity of the compound. For its, for its target so that it's easier just to do the back of the envelope calculation. Now, right, when a drug sort of has these sort of uh, parameters, what you'll eventually find is at steady state, they'll, they'll reach unity. And eventually in the brain compartment, you'll have 250 nanomolar free concentration of drug, right? And in this particular case, this will lead to an occupancy of the target of 50%, right? So remember that going forward, as we sort of chat about things later on, in the talk that the KD or the KI, assuming the KI and KD are equivalent, um, will indicate the concentration or the free concentration at which 50% um, of the target is engaged. Now, if you have a drug like this, you don't really need a PET tracer, right? You can measure CSF, um, uh, you know, you can get by and it will work, you know, most of the time, right? And I, I think, you know, I, the, the old adage, right, that it works every time until it doesn't is true here. There are cases where this has certainly uh, gotten people into trouble. Now, <clears throat> on that same program, there were, there were certainly examples where things got much worse, right? There were, there were situations where drugs had significant PGP efflux, right? Their efflux ratios determined in vitro uh, were very high. Um, you know, but the rest of their parameters were very, very similar, right? And in these cases, what you end up seeing is something like a free concentration of drug in the brain around 10 nanomolar, uh, much higher in the plasma. And then sort of counterintuitively in the CSF, you see some, some different number, right? And I think I really want to point this out because um, time and time again, we've, this was observed at Merck, and none of us really published. 
Uh, maybe one day we can get Eric Kostetler or some of the folks at the Merck Group to come down and talk a little bit more about you know, their program and what they've been doing, what they've done over the last 15 years. But you know, the CSF is not an appropriate surrogate for brain concentration. It's just not. You know, X. Like whenever you know we see people in, internally at the company try to tell us that you know they're just going to measure CN, CSF concentrations, it's sort of like a collective eye roll. You know, this this is something that has been disproved several times internally, um, and even now you still see others trying to make the case that it's reasonable, i.e., Pfizer. Um, but again, this is just this is no good. Now, in this case, if you try to take a compound like this into the clinic. Um, you know, you'll, you'll end up having some trouble, right? And, and why you end up having trouble, right, is that the expression levels of these efflux pumps vary across species. So, you know, in mouse, rat, non-human, primate, and human, um, these numbers tend to go down for PGP, right, which is MDR1. Um, that being said, right, like the expectation here is that you'll get better as you go into humans from rodents. Um, and that's often true, but that being said, though, like carefully calibrating the, 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 the exposure in the brain is very difficult when you have uh, some amount of change, right? And then for BCRP, uh, there is even less of an understanding of what these numbers mean in terms of how they, they translate from preclinical species uh, into humans, right? So drugs actually get worse, right? And I was part of a program where we observed the situation where um, you know, rodent-based uh, IV-IV correlations, right, which is an in vitro, in vivo correlation, uh, looked good uh, in a rat, right, and then we moved to non-human primates, and it looked very bad. Um, and ultimately, it was a function of the increase in BCRP concentration going from, from rodent, rodents to non-human primates. Um, you know, and this is a paper, right, from the Pfizer group, which I, you know, we like to give a hard time to these folks. I don't think they're very good at CNS drug discovery. Um, they have tried a number of different ways, ultimately, to come up with various parameters and uh, preclinical data sets to somehow correlate uh, free fraction in the brain and free fraction in the plasma um, and assess some of the translational risk associated with it. But what they're really showing here is, is that um, you know, the percentage of their predictions within twofold of observed um, are, are not great, right? I mean, 50 to 60 percent of the time they're right um, in non-human primates. Um, they're, they're decent, right? It's not bad, but this is still not good, right? If you're, if you're getting ready to expend hundreds of millions of dollars for, say, a late stage uh, trial or proof of concept trial, you know, you want to have this, you know, be a situation where you're a little bit more confident. All right, so I'm going to just pause there for a second and drink some water, and then we'll move into an example of a program at Merck. So the program uh, at Merck that I'm going to discuss, right, is uh, CGRP, right? And so this is um, a target that's expressed in the a periphery and in the central compartment. And there are a number of small molecule drugs out there that target it, right? They're all antagonists. Um, and it's now known, right, that inhibiting this particular uh, target leads to anti-migraine effects, right? And so Amgen has recently had an, an antibody approved uh, for this indication. So at Merck, um, there was a significant sort of disagreement or question about whether or not one had to have a centrally active uh, agent in order to get complete efficacy, right? And, and this was really sort of laid to rest by using a PET study. Um, so I can never pronounce this guy right, uh, telagopant um, was a compound that was taken into the clinic. Um, so its KI is around 0.8 nanomolar. Um, another compound uh, similar to that, MK3207, was, which is, albeit more potent, was, was taken in, right? And you can see that their PGP efflux ratios are similar. Um, and then the PET tracer that was developed in the group, uh, 4232, again, comparable KI with 3207, but no PGP liability. Uh, w was used for imaging. Now, the sort of standard practice uh, in the group was to use autoradiography and saturation binding to confirm uh, that these tracers uh, were not only specific, but they had a uh, high signal uh, for the target relative to, to what was uh, found in tissue. And so in these cases, you can see that 
um, uh, 4232 in this case is a tritiated form of it, right, where we take tissue slices, incubate them, uh, and watch them, shows good differ differentiation uh, between uh, uh, tissue that does not contain CGRP receptor uh, versus tissue that does, right? And so most CGRP receptors found within the cere cerebellum, within the CNS compartment. Um, this is for a rhesus monkey, um, and this is in humans over here. And you can see very sort of similar uh, uh, images, right? So there's some slight exp expression in the, in the meninges, right? And this is on the, the CNS side. Um, I'm not going to talk about how they definitively showed that. Um, you have to sort of take my word for it. But in general, most of the activity is found in the cerebellum. So this is a, a, a basic RO curve, right? Um, and what I sort of want to do is walk you through how to interpret it, um, such that when we get to the, the paper in just a little bit, uh, everyone's kind of on the same page. Now, in general, uh, people show the, the receptor occupancy on, on the y-axis and then drug plasma concentration on the x-axis. In this case, we're using a logarithmic um, increase in, in plasma concentration of drug, right? And th these are not free drug levels, right? This is just total drug uh, plasma concentration, right? And so recall that 4232 is a non-PGP substrate, right? That's the tracer itself, and then 3207 um, and then uh, tel telagopant, right, are both PGP substrates. And so in this case, right, 40, 4232 shows an approximate EC50 of, of around uh, 10 nanomolar. And then as you go uh, up to 3207 and telagopant, you see uh, probably right, what's that, around 100, 100 nanomolar. And then you see something that looks like uh, micromolar plus for telagopant. And this, it makes sense based on their PGP liabilities. And so the images that you end up seeing, right, this is a high occupancy image. You can see that most of the signal has been displaced, right? And these are these are SUVs. I'm not a modeler, right? And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into how, um, you know, the modeling was done uh, in these particular studies, but you sort of uh, understand, right, that an SUV is essentially a, um, a normalized way of, of, of understanding radioactivity concentration uh, in a specific uh, compartment, either in the brain or in the periphery, um, right, and it's taking into account the weight of the patient and the dose of radioactivity that was given. So this is, this is rhesus monkey work, right, and this is sort of standard practice, develop the RO curve in rhesus monkey and then take those parameters into humans and then, and then validate. Um, and, you know, the interpretation of the, the RO curves in the, in the humans is sort of depicted here. I don't, I'm not going to show the RO curve, I'll just show some, some basic images. Um, and you can see that the telagopant uh, plasma concentration uh, required to get meaningful CGRP occupancy is very high, right? You have to get 16 micromolar. Um, and that the doses that are used clinically, which, which showed efficacy for telagopant in some of the earlier trials, uh, showed very insignificant CGPR occupancy, right? And so the, the firm conclusion here is that um, target engagement in the CNS for CG, CGRP is, is just not required for, for efficacy. Um, and, I, and I really think that this, this data was instrumental in, in others bringing forward antibodies uh, uh, into the clinic. So I'll just stop here with uh, the Merck stuff, and if anyone has any questions, I can, I can answer them, but otherwise I'll just move forward. I think it's fun that you were able to take us behind the curtain a little bit in terms of the way that these pharmaceutical companies either put a great deal of um, faith in PET and make sure that it's it's one of the steps versus thinking that they can skip it. Um, and I don't know, not having really interacted with too many pharma companies, how common it is or whether it's increasingly the case that people are, are looking to PET to do the non-invasive determination of whether or not if you think your drug is supposed to act in the brain, that it's actually getting there. Yeah, so the Merck group is unique, right, in the sense that they started doing this, I guess, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and I think NK1 was one of the biggest sort of examples of that that really caught the company, especially senior management's attention. Richard Hargreaves was responsible for that. Um, he, he basically convinced senior management at the time that all neuroscience programs had to have 
central target engagement pet tracers. Um, and so they're in one of the biggest pet groups, uh, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry was established and they've put together, I think now 16 pet tracers that went into the clinic um, to validate Ooh. and determine RO curves for every single compound we took in. Um, and I think the the power of it, right, is, and I, I mean, I can't really tell you all the recent examples of, of it. I mean, there's, there's one particular target um, that hopefully, you know, eventually people will be able to talk about that uh, everyone else failed, but Merck was able to, to continue moving forward with because we knew what occupancy was required to get efficacy. And we had done internal studies that demonstrated that our competitors were not hitting that occupancy. And with that confidence, we were able to design and implement a successful phase two trial. Um, so I think a lot of people have taken the lead or are sort of are following the, the lead that Merck took. Um, you know, but it's expensive to establish the infrastructure required to do it. Um, but that being said, though, like, I, I think it's becoming a lot more common. It's also very expensive to have a failed compound. So, I mean, one of the things that's that's um, always in the back of my mind when we think about our trials and how many, how many, unfortunately, trials where we've had medications that were tested that didn't pan out, and then later people show that, you know, for example, there's a huge plasma variability based on oral dose. It's not the same from person to person, so clearly the people are metabolizing the drug differently. This is, you know, a step even beyond that saying, look, even if you have plasma, you still really need to know brain. And so it's basically, it, it begins to, to bring this to sort of, if you don't have this, you could get fooled way down, way late in the development. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think what it does is it really simplifies the calculation associated with how much drug do I give, right? I mean, it's almost so easy, right, that with the right software, like a chemist like myself could figure out, you know, how much drug to give and on what basis. You know, if I had IV and POPK from a rhesus monkey, I could, you know, reasonably estimate how much drug to give. Right? You see, so that's, that's absolute gold when you consider just over, you know, several decades and I don't know if Kyle's on this call or not, but basically many different trials, for example, for cocaine medications. And there was usually from the funder, you know, you had to quote unquote pick a dose, right? Rather than know the dose or know something that would tell you what dose you really should be doing, you sort of look at, well, you could push the dose up to the point where side effects were not tolerable and you would go as high as you could, you know, but it was really, you know, making a best clinically informed guess, usually about the way that the drug had been used in some other disorder. And we may have a lot of, you know, what could have been candidate medications that would have worked lying on the cutting room floor because we didn't, you know, have the wherewithal to bring this technology to bear. So it's, you know, it's the reason that the PET is so appealing, as challenging as it is. Yeah, you know, and I, I think a lot of academic groups aren't too excited about doing this sort of work, right? Because it's, I mean, it, it's not, it's kind of like mowing the grass kind of sensation. I mean. <laughs> You, know, you do it and you get the number and it's great. But like at the end of the day, like most people don't like doing this, right? Because I think a pet study of this sort is where dreams go to die most often, right? Because you find out that you can't get the target occupancy you're looking for because either there's adverse effects or there's toxicity, um, you know, and more often than not, pet is used to make a no-go decision in, in the clinic. Um, well, the one of the, one of the interesting things, it's, it's important to do it, you know, it's important to do it early on. I mean, NIDA's buspirone trial, uh, you know, they reached for doses. They thought for cocaine that this m might be a, a D3 receptor agent in, in plain view. Of course, buspirone had been something that hadn't really elicited that much sort of clinical applause even for the disorders, anxiety that had, you know, sort of been offered for. But what was interesting is that they didn't do PET beforehand, they did it afterward. And when they finally did it afterward, you could see that the poor drug didn't have anything approaching occupancy that would be needed in, in terms of basically having an effect at the dose tried. And so it was an expensive adventure. Yeah, this and could they, basically abbreviate phase two. I mean, you, a lot of phase two is about finding the appropriate clinical dose. Absolutely. Basically. And, yeah. this, and, this you know, and, it just seems, and as you say, it may seem like mowing the lawn, but there's a lot of unmowed lawns. And then you have, then you find yourself, well, we'll continue the metaphor out in the weeds. Okay, so I'll shut up so you can go on. But anyway. 
Yeah, so I mean, t typical trial design, right, at Merck was to do this phase one, right? So we would we would do this in parallel with dose um, or ascending dose sort of, you know, mm -hmm. tox type type studies. Right. So this was all sort of fa phase one type work. Uh, so, Tom, before you yeah. before you go, on, uh, this is Chuck O'Brien. I'm just um, convinced by your data about how potent psilocybin is, but um, I'm wondering why so much recent work has been done with psilocybin and not continued with LST, which I think is even more potent. Uh, I think the, the clinical dose in a number of clinical trials using LST to treat alcoholism, for example, um, is something like uh, 50 micrograms for a 70 kilogram human. I think I have that right. But, but it's... Um, uh, it, it, do you do you know why the focus now is on psilocybin uh, when it originally that's you know LST that started the whole field? Yeah, um, I so let let's hold that question and I'll sort of revisit it in just a few slides. Okay. Um, I won't specifically address it, but I I, I want to make sure that I get through the next uh, ten minutes, right? Because we're we're at the forty six minute mark. Um, and is it okay if we just sort of pick it back up? Good idea. Yeah, I just want to make sure uh, I don't, uh, you know, everyone doesn't get cut off. But I will, we will pick that up. I, I do think it's a very interesting uh, conversation topic. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of very quickly now move into the actual, the, the meat of the, of the paper that I picked, right? And before I do that, I really just want to show you this timeline, which I, I snatched from a really nice uh, series in ACS Chemical Neuroscience, which is called uh, Dark Classics in Neuroimaging. Um, and so 5-HT2A, right, has, has been something that has quite a bit of history in our field, right? And so as far back as 1983, uh, NM, NMSP, right, was one of the first imaging ag agents that was able to, to visualize it. And then in 95, uh, Altanserin uh, was the first um, sort of truly subtype selective tracer. Um, and then there's been some further development, right? And so Altanserin and MDL are antagonists. Um, and then SIMB36 is the first agonist-based PET tracer for 5-HD2A, and that's, that's what we'll talk about. And I, you know, I, there's a, another fluorine 18 version of, of MDL, but I, I don't know, like, how, what the value statement is here. This, this is kind of, in my opinion, not true. Um, so significant work, right, has been accomplished with fMRI, right? And so Cara Harris, I think, is a leader in this field, and I, I want to re refer everyone to the 2012 PNAS paper, which I think, you know, is a great lead reference. And if you want to take a look at what's going on in that area, it's to totally worth it. Um, so let me just define terms real quick. So there's Altanserin, right, uh, MDL. There's the fluorine 18 one that I talked about, which I'm I'm not really too thrilled about its value statement. And then the SIMB36 tracer, which is the focus of the paper today. Um, so MDL, uh, the MHMZ, and uh, Altanserin, right, are relatively subtype selective. Um, so MDL in particular is very subtype selective. Um, this number is actually wrong for Altanserin, right? Like this is in rodents, but in uh, humans, this, this number is quite a bit higher. Now, SIMB is not subtype selective, and we'll see that in the, in the imaging data, right? So its affinity for 5-HD2A and 5-HD2C are, are essentially identical. And this is really common of almost all serotonergic psychedelics. So, Sort of step one following the, the Merck model, right, is autoradiography. So MDL, which we can um, sort of safe to say is a selective 5-HT2A ligand, uh, shows a very good displacement, right? And there doesn't appear to be any residual binding of the tracer to either white matter or gray matter tracks. There's a little bit, but not very much. Um, and then we look at uh, the tritiated form of SIMBI, right? You can see substantial uh, white matter, gray matter off-target binding. Um, there's, there's, you know, some areas, right, where there appears to be very high displaceable binding that's not really observed with MDL, um, could be 5-HTCC, you know, I, they're not really uh, sort of spending too much time to go into detail about it, but th this is concerning, right? This is not great. So the human imaging data, um, I think, actually looks pretty good. Right, and so uh, Altanserin versus uh, SIMBI, right? In this case, this is a BP versus a BPND. Um, 
right? This comes down to how they're modeling it, but sort of suffice to say there's some differences in the, in the cortical regions between these two tracers. Uh, but mo most importantly, right, it's, it's subcortical differences, right? And the subcortical differences uh, are expected. So these are regions where the 5-HD2C receptor is expressed. Um, the, the cortical distribution of 5-HD2C uh, is very low, uh, close to zero. And so I think the sort of point they're trying to make here is that um, uh, carbon-11 SIMBI is a useful PET tracer for assessing uh, cortical 5-HD2A uh, levels. And I, and I agree with them. I mean, the tracer looks okay for, for this particular context. So let's kind of just jump into the, the trial real quick. Um, the, it's not a very complex sort of setup. I think it's done in a really nice way because they, they have the ability to do the second scan in the same day. And this is one of the really nice features of Carbon-11 that I think is often sort of not, not really picked up on a lot in uh, academia. In industry, we preferred Carbon-11 because you could do two scans in one day. Um, so you didn't have to bring patients back on later days and so on. Um, and that's really owing to its short half-life, 20 minutes. And so the, what they're using is the Likert uh, intensity scale, right? And so this is basically assessing how strong a psychedelic experience is. Zero, not intense, 10, intense, right? And again, this is a function of those subjective effects I described earlier. So patients are dosed in the scanner with psilocybin. Um, they're, they're offered benzodiazepines uh, if they become anxious or, or have a difficult experience. Uh, no, no one in this particular study used it. Um, there's, there's music that plays over a speaker, which was provided by Roland Griffith's group. Um, you know, and I think the sort of point is, is that they were able to recapitulate some of what uh, was done in, in the clinical studies, right? It's, it's not too, too difficult. Um, that being said, a PET scanner is not an ideal place to sit. Um, so 60 minutes after the first dose, they start the first PET scan, and then 344 minutes after the, the psilocybin dose, um, they begin the second scan. And these are 120 minute scans. And then toward the end of the day, they then fill out a subjective effect questionnaire. So there's um, three of them that they use, right? There's the uh, 11 dimensional altered states of consciousness questionnaire, the mystical experiences questionnaire, and the ego dissolution inventory. And I'm not gonna really get into these, right? And they're, they're used in a lot of the open label and randomized trials that I described earlier. I, I think this time period here was t was picked right because of the the experience is generally considered to be at peak 60 minutes post dose, um, and I, I think what you end up seeing in the, in the data is you know relatively compelling right so the plasma psilocin concentrations uh, seem to map on pretty well to intensity right so this pink is is the highest uh, concentration of or plasma concentration of drug right this is on 30 30 megs po. Um, you end up seeing a very intense uh, experience in that particular patient. Um, similar things are observed in blue and then the purple patient, right? And so these are also the higher end doses. Um, and then the lower doses, right? So subject one who had three milligrams and subject two had six milligrams, right? Their plasma psilocin levels are in between two and four micrograms per liter um, had, had, the, had the mildest subjective experience. I did think it was interesting that subject three um, you know, had a, a modest dose of 12 milligrams, but had a very intense subjective experience. And I, I couldn't see if there was anything about, since there were only eight people, I thought I would look in the supplemental to see if I could see anything. I couldn't see anything about it. But it just points to the fact that there is, and they, coined, they, they mentioned this too, substantial individual, um, you know, variation, even yeah. though it does correlate. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, definitely. Right. I think this is one of the really the tough things, right, with with CNS drug discovery, I'm sure as, as you guys know way better than I do. Um, you know, and I, I really wanted to, you know, I was just gonna point that out, but I, I think oh, I highlighted the, the wrong one here. Well, the one I really wanna sort of point out here, right, is subject one. Um, I'm not sure why this is subject two. Maybe I moved this accidentally. But subject two's um, PET scan, this, the second PET scan right there, there's no, you know, measurable psilocin concentration and the occupancy is close to zero, right? And what I think it's clearly showing here is, is that, um, you know, in contrast with all, all the in vitro studies that have been done over the years, right? Uh, and the, the predominant theory, right, is, is that tolerance of these drugs, which I didn't really discuss, is caused by receptor internalization, right? And, and it's thought, at least in, in an in vitro sense, that occurs very quickly 
and it's long lasting, meaning it takes up to a week for this to reverse itself. Um, and in this case, you're able to see um, a BPND value that's comparable to baseline within, you know, less than an hour of, of dosing with something that, that causes, you know, significant occupancy at 5-HT2A. So I'll sort of follow up with that in the, on the last slide, but I thought, I thought that was an interesting observation. Um, and, I, and the rest of it, I think it sort of speaks for itself, right? You have a nice sort of occupancy psilocin concentration curve. Um, you know, and I think one of the things they point out is that if they take this out, um, they only get up to the maximum occupancy of 77%. But, you know, I think one of the limitations of their design, what I want to point out here is that and I wouldn't have done this if it was me. I would not have picked only one low dose. I would have picked maybe three or four of them. I think if they had more more data points here for some of the lower end occupancy numbers, I think they're, when they try to fit this curve, it might end up looking a little bit better. I mean, this actually looks kind of like what I expect. I would expect. And oftentimes to get up to a level where you're going to get, you know, 100% occupancy, you probably have to triple, triple to increase this by an order of magnitude uh, to do it. So I would, I would, if it was a non-human primate study and I was picking the dose, I probably would have picked 150 to 200 milligrams of psilocybin for the 100% wow. occupancy, um, which is something that I frequently did for for drugs, which I knew were safe, right? But in this case. Um, you know, this is not something that you can do in, in humans. So I, I don't know if I really buy all this, like, you know, conversation they have around that. Um, I just don't think it's complete. I, I think importantly, right, there's a good relationship between occupancy and intensity, which is which is nice. It's what you want to see, right? And then the, the psilocin sort of uh, plasma concentration, again, sort of fit, fits that decently, right? And so the OC50, they calculate is around 10 nanomole of psilocin in the periphery. Right, and this is comparable to the cherry-picked KI values which they give in the paper, right? And I think the sort of takeaway here is, is that, you know, the KPUU should be close to one. I mean, this is a fairly well-behaved agent, um, and I think as long as you pick the right dose, you should be able to reproducibly get occupancy that, that you're interested in, assuming there's not major differences in metabolism from patient to patient. You know, this is only eight subjects. I mean, I think it's important in some sense that people are reporting something around 10 as intensity, even though occupancy is not going above 70, right? Right. So, I think that's that's a good so, sign. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't want to go <laughs> necessarily, you know, too much higher. Multiply, multiply the dose way up there when you're getting at least at that point subjective effects that are intense but don't require benzos or something else for management. Yeah. Depend on what your what your desired effect is. I mean, what if you need a five for uh, PTSD or smoking cessation, and you don't want the effects to last for three days? So I yeah. think I, I think you know you you want to you want to push the system, but you don't want to overwhelm it. Right. A lot of ways. So I think you have to look at what your clinical your clinical goal is. Yeah, and I you know I, I think this slide really sort of you know, points out, what I, I think that was Jake, right? Um, yes. Is, is trying to say here, right, is, is that, you know, when you pick your dose for a trial, you're, you're locked into that. You can't just retro, well, you, I mean, some people do, this is really a no-no, right? You can't just go back and change a dose or change the endpoints, right? And there, there are two phase two, phase three studies that are being funded by Compass, which is a UK-based company, which just completed 100 million Series B, um, and then uh, USONA, which is a, a private nonprofit uh, organization, and they're looking in uh, two indications, treatment-resistant depression, right, which is, you know, an indication that's not as significant as, as major depressive disorder, which is what USONA is going for. Um, both trials are similar in terms of their design. One of them uses a dose-finding paradigm between 0.1 and 0.3 MPK, um, and then the second one, um, which is the larger indication, USONA, uses uh, 25 um, megs PO, uh, single dose. Um, I think this trial, from my perspective, gets two thumbs down, right? I, I don't think this is clever. I don't think it's a good idea to just pick a single dose. Yeah. Um, unless they have some other kind of biomarker that I'm not aware of that they're not putting in here, this seems really risky. Um, I think Compass is picking something that's going to be more expensive. Um, they're doing dose fine, and they, they, they should see hopefully some type of dose response. And I think this lays the foundation for a further trial later down the road. So 
I guess we'll see how these pan out. 2020, 2021 is when they should read out. Um, but you know, in the last minute here, I just want to like point something out that I think is you know intriguing. Uh, it was reported in 1984, um, and, and in this case, and this is the the, the P30 connection. Um, you know, and this is work that's followed up based on some preclinical data that's been been published by other groups. This paper has been cited a total of uh, five times, and it was one of the last uh, non-human primate studies conducted in the U.S. with, with LSD or, or psilocybin. Um, and what they were essentially doing was is they were uh, designing a study, right, where they had a rotating disc with a marshmallow on it, um, and then they had a monkey in a cage reach out, grab the marshmallow, um, and, then, and then eat it, right? And so you get these reward responses, and then the basic study design is such that you do either vehicle, one MPK LSD IV, um, vehicle and then use naloxone and LSD, naloxone and vehicle, and then vehicle, vehicle. And so what they sort of show, right, is is that, you know, you see the, the, the baseline effect. You see that LSD uh, clearly uh, influences the monkey's ability to grab the marshmallow. Um, but once you get up to the higher test sessions, they return to baseline, right? And this is because of the tolerance associated with, L with LSD. Um, and then if you take a break, um, you, can, you can show that you know, you're back to back to where you are baseline with vehicle. Um, and then if you dose with naloxone, um, somewhat intriguingly, what you see is um, an effect which blocks the tolerance formation of, of LSD in these non-human primates. Um, and it was actually a little bit unnerving to the investigators, right? And so they show that there was no uh, tolerance that was, was, uh, was, was uh, established. And the effects of LSD seem to be dramatically potentiated, which I didn't include here i.e. the monkeys um, were no longer moving, they were kind of lying on the ground, essentially. Um, wow. and they, actually, they actually discontinued the study, right, because they became so concerned that, um, you know, the monkeys were no longer able to respond. Uh, they, were, they were worried about their, their well-being at that particular point. Um, That's really intriguing, actually, but scary. It is, yeah. And I think sort of, you know, why did I really want to bring this particular point up, right? I mean... I think if you look in the literature, you'll see essentially no sort of discussion about whether or not these agents uh, have any impact on endogenous uh, opioid release um, at all. It's, it's just not, not out there. There are a few other papers on this topic. Uh, they've been cited two or three times. Um, and as far as I can tell, there's, there's really no follow-up. So I like to always leave a talk with some amount of, uh, you know, interesting observation. I think this sort of buttresses um, well with the, the fact that the some of the first in vivo studies in humans seem to seem to really um, take a shot, right, at whether or not, you know, internalization is necessarily to do with with tolerance with these with these agents. Like it just points out that there's not a lot known about them. Well, and to go back to, to give Chuck's question, it, it's a due. Um, any thoughts about LSD versus oh, yes. psilocybin. Yeah, and you know, there's a really good um, book on this topic, Chuck, that I, I think um, would be worth, you know, taking a look at it. Michael Pollan wrote it uh, recently. It's called How to Change Your Mind. And he actually addresses this question specifically, right? And he talks about uh, through interviews with the key players, right, when they were originally planning which uh, compound to start up again with, uh, psilocybin versus uh, LSD, they went with LSD, right, partially on the advice of a former NIDA um, sort of drug, drug czar, I can't recall his name now, um, who suggested, right, that psilocybin just doesn't have the sort of, um, you know, the, the cachet associated with it that, that LSD does, right? I mean, LSD was really the, the compound that was associated with the countercultural movement of, of the 60s. Um, psilocybin is something that at the time, you know, is not really... A compound that people really knew about. It wouldn't necessarily elicit the types of uh, sort of concern, perhaps, that LSD would, sh should it end up show showing up in, uh, in in the public discourse. I, I really think that's just about it, to be honest with you. I, I think some practitioners, based on what I read, would argue that psilocybin is a little easier to deal with because the duration of effect is four to six hours, whereas LSD can be as long as eight to 12 hours. For both drugs, um, I'm guessing that there's a lot of individual variability, which is why you can sometimes get surprised, even with a small dose, 
of either one in someone. But it's really interesting, the interaction you showed with the opioid system, um, with the essentially the endogenous opioid system, because it's, it's seeming to say here that at least for LSD, and I don't know if this would be true for psilocybin, that, you know, blocking the opioid receptors really enhances these 5-HT2A effects. Yeah, but whether or not it's enhancing it in a positive or negative way, I mean, I think it's really difficult to, to assess, right? I mean, one of the sort of confounding things associated with these substances is that they can cause effects that patients describe as the most challenging of their life. Um, yeah. Or yeah. conversely, the most rewarding of their life, right? You know? Yeah. I, I it's, it's true, but people, p people, even with regular old antidepressants, people uh, do angst about the fact that sometimes, you know, the benefits seem to sometimes over weeks, months, or years diminish. And that if you had something that could reset the system and that would actually reduce the tolerance, if these turn out to have beneficial effects, th that might be actually something welcome if it's done in a controlled pharmacologic way, you know? There could be something beneficial about restoring efficacy. Let's say they work on these trials that are going to be unblinded, and we'll all stay tuned. Uh, so this finding that you mentioned at the end is kind of intriguing and something to put in the back pocket as that goes forward. Yeah. But you, you said there's evidence that it, it doesn't, that LSD does not release endogenous morphine? Uh, you mean, uh, and it, so there is no sort of, so unfortunately, there are no microdialysis uh, experiments that were done with LSD that, or psilocybin that were specifically looking for um, all of the different endogenous opioids. There is one um, microdialysis experiment which shows that uh, entcaphalin is, re is released, or sorry, rather is um, rapidly depleted following LSD administration. Um, and so it you know, reminds me of a study that they're doing or might be doing, I don't know if Bob Malison and I'll call my buddy Ansel is doing at Yale, which is they're seeing if THC um, elicits endogenous morphine release by doing a carfentanil experiment and then giving THC and seeing if there's receptor occupancy. Yeah. Well, so, so theoretically, you could test this with PET. Yeah, it'd be very easily, right, either in preclinical or in clinical setting, um, right? And I mean, people have done no, Not as easily studies. as you think, but you could test this with PET, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, you know, relative to, uh, you know, associated with, like, you know, doing, like, a microdialysis experiment in non-human primates. Right? right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm speaking from the regulatory standpoint. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a hurdle, <laughs> for sure. Don't get me wrong. I consider it to be a real obstacle, sorry. A real obstacle. You know, Tom, this has been a real tour de force in terms of offering everything that you have in terms of the history and obviously uh, the chemistry and the pharmacology and, and the pet applications, as well as giving us a little bit behind the curtain of, of drug company medication development and something that, you know, has not been necessarily part of medication trials thus far in, in our field, but I think it'd benefit. So anybody got any extra questions for Tom? Do you want to bring them on? To email, or do you want to take a last moment here? Right, show time.